I do not see why you should have been expected to ask Sokol about his Lubrizol stock holdings when he said he owned the stock. That wouldn't have been a natural question. But when you found out the details of his stock purchases a short time later, I do not understand your reaction. Surely you realized immediately that these facts were going to become known and that they were going to damage Berkshire's reputation, something you had said repeatedly you would be re ruthless in protecting. Being ruthless probably would have meant you're firing Sokol on the spot, but you didn't do that. And then you put out a press release that many Berkshire shareholders that I have talked to found totally inadequate. You have always been very direct in stating things. You were not direct in that press release except in praising David Sokol. Otherwise, you stated some facts and behavior that you said you didn't believe was illegal. And then you ended the release, leaving us. Now, maybe you thought it, somehow we, you, we were going to read between the lines without expressing any anger about what had happened. Why were you not incensed? If you were, why did you not express your anger? Why did you handle this matter in the inadequate way you did? It wasn't really immediately thereafter. I learned on March 14th, which was the day we announced, and now bear in mind his first conversation when he said he owned the stock was January 14th. Uh, in between January 14th and March 14th, uh, Dave gave no indication that he'd had any contact with Citigroup of any kind. And I mean, as we learned later, I mean, he went, they met in maybe October or something like that where, and talked about possible acquisition candidates for, for Berkshire. But none of that, he, uh, he told me at one point, he said Evercore and, and uh, City represent Lubrizol. One of them represents the directors and one of them represents the company and, and not a word about any contact. On March 14th, when the deal was announced in the morning, I got a call from John Freund. John Freund is probably here today. John Freund works for City in Chicago, and he handles, he's handled the great majority of our business in equities for decades. And I've got a direct line to him. I talk to him frequently. And he called and said, uh, congratulations, and, you know, and, uh, and, Aren't you proud of our words to the effect? You can talk to John directly, although I've been told that the city lawyers have told him not to talk, but that knowing the press, they get out of him. The, uh, the, he's, essentially, his words were that, that city's team had worked with Dave on this acquisition and they were proud to be part of it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, this was all news to me. Uh, so that set up some yellow lights at least. And the next day I had Mark Hamburg, our CFO, call Dave. And Dave readily gave him the information about when he had bought the stock and how much. Mark also asked him what the participation of, of City had been in the reference to Berkshire side of the transaction. And Dave said that, well, he, called a fellow, he thought he called a fellow there to get their phone number, uh, which turned out to be somewhat of an understatement. Um, now, during the period when we announced the deal on March 14th, Lubrizol, is the one that needed to prepare a proxy statement. We were not issuing shares at Berkshire, so there was no proxy statement, no uh, uh, nothing of this, that sort on our part. The Lubrizol legal team, Jones Day, went to work with the Lubrizol management to start preparing the proxy statement. Uh, we eagerly awaited uh, to see the first draft of that, because I was going to be leaving for Asia on Saturday. 
uh, which I guess would be uh, the 19th, and I wanted to see what Lubrizol had to say about this whole city matter or anything else. They, the most interesting part of every proxy statement is something that says, uh, it's basically the, the history of the transaction, and, and, and it's, it's the first thing I read on any, any deal because it, it, it gives you a blow-by-blow blow of what has taken place. And as Mark Hamburg can tell you, I kept, and our law firm can tell you, I kept urging them to get that to me before I took off uh, for Asia. Uh, we got that the afternoon of Friday the 18th, and it had a fair amount of material in it about Dave's involvement uh, with Citigroup. Um, then at that point, uh, I believe it was at that point, uh, our law firm got involved, Munger Tolls got involved in their input to the Lubrizol uh, lawyers as to what we had seen that was different or what we had seen that they didn't know about that we could add. Ron Olson, the director of Berkshire and partner of Munger Tolls, was on the trip to Asia. So we got on the plane on, on Saturday the 19th and traveled over the next week until the 26th. And we knew at that point that his partners uh, at Munger Tolls were interviewing Dave, as maybe some other people too, but certainly Dave. And I believe that he was interviewed at least three times uh, about both the stock purchases, the history of things with, uh, of his relationship with, uh, with Citigroup, and they were assembling this information. I don't have a Blackberry or whatever it may be. Uh, Ron does, so he would get some information as we were over there, and he was getting some input, but, uh, uh, and we decided that, that when we got back, we would need to have a prompt meeting of the Berkshire Board about this matter. And we would also learn what the full details, at least of what Bob Denham and, and maybe other attorneys at, at Munger Tolls uh, learned from uh, their interviews with Dave. And we got back on, I guess it would be Saturday the 26th, and on the 28th, we were going to bring Charlie into it before uh, calling a board meeting, but there would have been a board meeting that week, and then uh, about the uh, afternoon, uh, a letter was delivered by Dave's assistant, which really came out of the blue, and I, he said to me, uh, he felt he was retiring on a high point, and he gave the reasons why he was retiring, which I laid out and so on. Uh, I don't know whether the questioning the previous week had affected his attitude. He would say not. Uh, but in any event, uh, we had that resignation. That resignation, uh, as is, I believe it may have been put in the uh, Audit Committee report, um, may have saved us some money. If we'd fired him, uh, the question would be whether it was with cause or, or not with cause, and we would have said it was with cause, but that might have very well gotten litigated, and, and a retirement did provide, in effect, the same non-level of severance payments that, uh, that a, a firing uh, with cause provided. So I drafted up uh, a press release, which has since been the subject of at least mild <laughs> criticism. <laughs> and uh, I laid out the good things that Dave had done, which he had done for the company. He had done many good things, uh, some extraordinary things. And, and then I laid out uh, some actions which I said, based on what I knew then, uh, uh, did not seemed to me to be unlawful, and incidentally, I talked with, with um, both Charlie and Ron about that. Uh, Ron would have been 
more careful in that wording. I'm not sure Charlie would have been. Uh, I'll let him speak for himself on that. Uh, and we ran it by, I ran it by Dave on Tuesday morning, just to be sure the facts were accurate. And he said he objected very much to something that I'd put in where I said that I thought that he was, in effect, had had his hopes dashed for succeeding me, and that was part of the reason. And he said that was absolutely not true, that he had no hopes ever of succeeding me, and, uh, and that I, you know, basically, he was telling me what was in his mind, and I shouldn't be trying to, to uh, second guess what was in his mind. So I took that part out. Uh, but he affirmed all of the other facts in that letter, and then I took it out, I sent it to him a second time, to make sure that uh, he was okay with the facts, and he said they were accurate. Now, in there was included the fact that Dave uh, had no indication that, that uh, Lubrizol had any interest in an approach from Berkshire, and that, at least according to the final Lubrizol uh, uh, proxy, is not the case. I have not talked to anybody except John Freund at, at, at uh, Citigroup, so I, I have no idea what took place with the investment bankers at Citigroup, except for what I read in the Lubrizol proxy. But the Lubrizol proxy now says that, that Dave did know that Lubrizol had an interest on December uh, 17th. But both in the two chances he had to review it, and then when he went on CNBC uh, on a Thursday and talked for half an hour, he, did, he made no attempt to to correct any of the facts in it. Now on Wednesday, when we put out the report, we had to have a board meeting first. Uh, it was news to the board. Uh, they got the release a little bit ahead of time, and then we had a board meeting. Uh, we also uh, delivered, uh, well, we've, through, our, through our law firm, we phoned the head of the enforcement division of the Securities and Exchange Commission and told them exactly the facts uh, regarding the stock purchases and, and, uh, and uh, anything else that they might have cared to know. Uh, so I think we acted uh, in that case very, very promptly uh, to make sure the Securities and Exchange Commission and the top of the enforcement division was uh, well-versed on what had taken place to our knowledge up to that point. So from our standpoint, my standpoint, Dave minimum chances for uh, lawsuits about compensation to him. And we had turned over some very damning evidence, in my view, uh, to both the public and to the SEC. Uh, what I think bothers people is that there wasn't some big sense of outrage or something in the in the uh, in the uh, release, and uh, you know I plead guilty to that. I, I, I this fellow had done a lot of good things for us over 10 or 11 years, and I felt that if I'm laying out a whole bunch of facts that are going to create lots of problems for him for years to come, that I also uh, list his side of the. Uh, uh, equation in terms of what he'd done for Berkshire, and I, uh, and as I said a little bit earlier, you know, one thing I didn't even lay out was this extraordinary act where, in effect, he turned over twelve and a half million dollars to a fellow employee. Uh, so that that's the history of my thinking on it. <laughs> Charlie, you want to add anything? Well, yes. Well, I think we can concede that that press release was not the cleverest press release in the history of the world. <laughs> the facts were complicated, and we didn't foresee appropriately the natural reaction. But I would argue that you don't want to make important decisions in anger. You want to display as much ruthlessness as your duty requires, and you do not want to add one single iota because you're angry. So 
Tom Murphy, one of our best directors, one of our best directors always told the people at Cap Cities, you can always tell a man to go to hell tomorrow if it's such a good idea. <laughs> and so the, the anger part of it, and I don't think it was wrong to remember the man's virtues as well as his error. I might add as an aside, Charlie and I have worked together for 52 years, and we have disagreed on a lot of things. We've never had an argument. It, uh, you know, we, I, I need Tom Murphy's advice to remind myself of it a lot of times on other things, but with Charlie, it's never even been necessary. I, long before I met Murph. 